<clears throat> Hello, one and all. I bring you greetings from the saints of the Socialist Republic of California. Yeah. In all seriousness, um, and I know I do actually remember that I say this every time that the Lord allows me to come, but uh, Lynn and I deeply love you all, and it's a huge delight to be here. I was sitting there just just uh, a minute ago, um, yeah, just thinking about like Acts 17, uh, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy roll into to Macedonia. They end up in, in Thessalonica, and they see a great work of God done, and then that missionary team... Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy write the letter to First Thessalonians or of First Thessalonians, and basically he says a great work of God has been done there in Thessalonica, and then he urges them more, 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 more. Specifically, more love, more faith, more hope. Right? He, yeah, I hear about your love. I hear about your faith. Right? More, more, more. And the whole theme of First Thessalonians is sanctification. Um, we're not going to talk about that this morning. I am going to talk about Exodus. But I was just sitting here thinking, I really love this assembly, and I love these people. And um, yeah, and not just from, just from me to you, like from my heart to you. Um, let what God has done so far in this place be a lion or a bear compared to the Goliath that's coming. Yeah, yeah, just let it be a start. Let it be just a, a cigarette lighter compared to the flame that's coming, the fire that's coming, more, 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 more. You end up at the end of Thessalonians, like he says, that you may be sanctified wholly at the coming of body, soul, and spirit at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah, more, more, more. That would be my prayer for you. Let's, um, yeah, let's bow our heads and commit this time to the Lord. Father, I just want to say thank you for Boulevard Bible Chapel. Thank you specifically for for the elders, for the deacons, for the saints. Uh, thank you for every gift. Thank you for every member of the body. 1 Corinthians 12 makes it super clear that every member of the body is necessary. Uh, Satan would be really, really happy with one part of the body this morning thinking that they don't really matter that much. Um, Satan would be really happy if he could cause division, if he could cause separation from the body. Lord, in my own sinful flesh, there have been multiple times in my Christian life where I've been tempted, maybe discouragement, maybe exhaustion, and I'm not making any excuses, but in my flesh, I've been tempted to just let there be more, more space between me and God's people. And over and over again, you've used your word, um, he who isolates himself seeks his own gain. Yeah, we don't isolate ourselves from the people of God on Jesus' behalf. We do it for self. Yeah, so Lord, I just want to commit this body to you. Uh, Lord, I love them. I'm talking to a God who loves them infinitely. Uh, it's one thing for me to say to them, let what God has done so far just be the beginning. Lord, it's a whole nother thing for me to say to you on behalf of this local assembly. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, according to the word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, that what this assembly has seen so far would be a cigarette lighter compared to the forest fire that's coming. Yeah, I pray that you would use them in your omnipotent power, that you would move today. Lord, yes, I pray for down the road, but we ask today, Lord, nobody loves the people in this room like you. Nobody knows the people in this room like you. Lord Jesus, you're the answer to our hopes, to our dreams. You're the answer to our fears. You're the fulfillment of our hearts. Lord, some of us know that to a great, great extent, and some of us know that to a far lesser extent. Some of us this morning would be being tempted to look to other things for fulfillment than Jesus Christ. Oh, there's so many. I mean, we have a devil out there. You know him perfectly, Father. There's a devil out there that whispers lies to the people of God, and some of those lies... Are, are some of those lies are getting through. Some of those lies are being entertained in people's minds and people's hearts. Yeah, we think of your word that says, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing 
of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So, Lord, we ask that your power would be unleashed in this auditorium today. Yeah, for the glory of Jesus Christ alone, but also, Father, you know I'm praying it for, for the people that are here. Lord, whatever you want to do in my life, yeah, I'm so far from the, the beauty of the character of Jesus Christ that, man, I want to be changed. But, Lord, my brothers and sisters, I love them. If I love them, that's just a tiny little reminder of the infinite burning, passionate love of God. You're able to move in people's lives, but you don't force your love on people. We have laws against forcing love on people. We would say that that's wrong. You and your infinite holiness, you don't force your love on the people in this room, but you will bid them come today. And we just pray for yieldedness before we even crack our Bibles. We pray for yieldedness and we pray that you would move in your power and in your love. Yeah, help us, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So um, we are in Exodus 4 this morning. I am trusting that last week you dealt with, um, in Exodus 3, there's two, two lies, or sorry, two excuses uh, that Moses makes. And then we're going to kind of pick up partway through that and look today at three excuses, one encouragement, and um, and one warning. Yeah, so if you're taking notes, you could jot that down. Three excuses, one encouragement, and one warning. That's chapter 4, 1 through 26, and I think for sake of time, we're just going to kind of read it incrementally as we go as we go through it. So for help with context, one person, speaking of Moses' excuses, put it this way. When God commissioned Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, he replied, who am I? In the first place, he questioned his ability to face Pharaoh. Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh? In the second place, he questioned his ability to lead Israel and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. It is, of course, quite wrong for any servant of God to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, Romans 12, 3. On the other hand, it is equally wrong to question the will of God and to make our limitations an excuse for failure to serve him. When God calls us to serve him, he always makes available the necessary resources, and Moses was no exception. The command, come now, therefore I will send thee, was accompanied by the promise, certainly I will be with thee. The Lord Jesus commissioned his disciples in the same way. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Like Moses, we all feel our weaknesses, whether in leadership or in any area of service. But like Moses, we are all promised divine strength. Let us listen again to the voice of our beloved Lord as he says, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm assuming that we looked at two excuses last week, and then we're going to pick up with those excuses. So three excuses, one encouragement, one warning. I want to start out with a question today. Before the Lord, I just want to ask this question, and I would encourage you, like if you're taking notes, you could, you could write this down. Um, or if you're just listening, I'm one of those that typically just listens. Uh, maybe you could ask the Lord to hide it away in your heart. But this is the question. What is the Lord calling me to today? And then you could, I mean, you could do a variation. What might the Lord be calling me to in the next season? But either way, I think the most important thing for us today is what what is the Lord calling me to today? You know, there's some of you that know exactly what the Lord's calling you to, but you've been resisting it. In any group of Christians this size, in any group that includes me, there are times that we really wrestle over these things. So I'm asking, what is the Lord calling you to today? It's kind of fun to be at a stage of life where I can say things like this, like, Two decades ago, um, we had a young couple 
And um, yeah, they were gloriously saved. They were married, got a little way into marriage, discovered that it's not all grins and giggles. And um, by the time we heard about it, uh, they were just about done with each other. We went to meet with them. And you know, it took 15 minutes of awkward silence. It took 15 minutes at least, 15 minutes of asking them, do you believe that God is right? It took 15 minutes before they would answer that yes. And there was really no question in the room about whether or not they believed God was right. It was a battle of their will. Because if they said God was right, then that meant that they had to submit to what God had said And because they had hurt each other, they didn't want to submit to that. It's just a battle of wills. That'll happen in this room today, a battle of wills. Many of you will know what God is calling you to do today. And so the question will be, will you be like Moses and make excuses? Or will you ultimately be like Moses and see my excuses are not valid? I must obey God. So maybe God would call you to witness to a coworker, to witness to your boss. Maybe God would call you to do a job you don't like. Maybe God would call you to help at a kids club, clean the building, prepare for ministry when you would prefer to watch a movie with your wife. That happened to me in my 20s. That's why I wrote that down. Yeah. I thought, I'm exhausted. Yeah, working two jobs. Yeah, I'm not complaining. I'm just being honest with you. On a Saturday... I thought, I'd love to just watch a movie with my wife. Yeah. And there was a choice there. Am I going to prepare to feed God's people? Or am I going to just do what would be really easy and satisfying to my flesh in this moment? Uh, Maybe the Lord would call you to be a missionary. There's six million people in the greater area of Phoenix. The Lord has already started the Phoenix team. And I love this. One of the brothers on that Phoenix team is already praying for eight more teams. I love that. I had never taken the step of doing this, but he looked at he looked up Phoenix and then he looked at the map and he saw that other than Phoenix proper, there are eight metropolises like Scottsdale, all these different metropolises. There are eight of them that have over 100,000 people. So he hasn't even hit the ground yet in Phoenix and he's already praying that the Lord will raise up more missionary teams. Maybe the Lord would use you as a missionary. I mean, I know the Lord will want to use you as a missionary. Maybe the Lord will prepare you to go halfway around the world. Maybe the Lord will prepare you to go halfway around the country. Maybe the Lord would ask you to be an elder, an elder's wife, a full-time worker, a faithful saint. Maybe the Lord would call you to self-sacrificially love your spouse in a relationship where you're not getting what you dreamed of getting from your marriage. And you have a choice to make. Like, am I still going to believe God? Yeah, what would the Lord call you to do today? We're getting that right from our text. Like, this is Exodus 3, Exodus 4. Uh, The bush burns. Moses is called. So Moses grew up in Egypt. He was next in line for for reigning in Egypt. According to Josephus, Moses was like the LeBron James of of Egypt, the Michael Jordan, if you're my age, the Michael Jordan of Egypt. Um, Yeah, according to Josephus, he led the armies of Egypt out against the Ethiopians. He used a military strategy that completely took the Ethiopian army by surprise. He demolished the Ethiopian army. So not only was he in this royal family, but he was also famous He was a military hero, according to history that we can read. Yeah, he really became something in Egypt. And then now he's spent 40 years becoming nothing in the desert. I trust you guys have have talked about this. And then all of a sudden he became something, he became nothing. He became little enough for God to actually use him. And then now he's being called to this incredible task. That's where our question comes from. What would the Lord call you to? It has to start with what would he call you to today, an act of obedience today. It has to start with that. But there is the question out there. Like these, what we're going to look at are hindrances to the amazing life the Lord wants for you. 
the three excuses that we'll look at today, those are just hindrances to the amazing life the Lord Jesus is longing for you to live. Moses was being called to an incredible life. Amen? And his response was like five times. So he starts out, I'm not good enough. I trust you looked at that last week. God's answer, I will be with you. And then he says, I don't know enough. God's answer, I am who I am. You don't have to defend God. You just represent God. He's perfectly capable of defending himself. And then you get to where we are this week. Um, what if they won't believe me? That's excuse number three. I mean, in the text. Like for today, that's excuse number one. But let's read chapter four, verse one. Then Moses answered and said, suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. He said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand, caught it. It became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom. He put his hand in his bosom. When he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. He said, put your hand in your bosom again. He put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom and behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be if they do not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice that you shall take water from the river, pour it on the dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. So this is our first excuse for this week in the text, like Exodus 3, Exodus 4. This is excuse number three. If you're taking notes, you could jot down, what if they don't believe me? I don't, I don't know about you guys, but man, I read through this story every single time, and I just think, oh man, I mean, it reminds me of me. Yeah, and I just mean the excuses. It's so easy for me to identify with Moses. What if they don't believe me? And it seems like he's remembering the rejection of chapter 2. The book of Acts a commentary on what we're looking at, would say of Moses, um, he supposed that his brethren would understand. Do you remember that little phrase? Man, I read that and it just hurts my heart. He supposed, he thought that his brothers and sisters would understand, but they didn't understand. He had been deeply wounded, right? He tried to side with the people of God. He ended up having to run for his life. He spent the last 14,600 days in the desert watching sheep. This is the LeBron James of Egypt. The greatest show, the most famous person in Egypt. And he's, he's spent 14,600 days doing a job that he wouldn't even been associated with in his former life. And so the Lord calls him to a great act of service, a great life of service. And one of his excuses is, they didn't believe me before. What if they don't believe me this time? He remembers the rejection. The Lord's answer, yeah, and please get this down. Like Moses' excuse, what if they don't believe me? God's answer, what is that in your hand? That's really beautiful. That's verse 2. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a rod. In this text, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself, but in this text, the rod of Moses becomes the rod of God. A simple thing that he picked up in menial service that he never would have voted for or thought he would have ended up in this life. A simple tool in his hand that he picked up after 40 years in the desert. What is that in your hand? It's Moses' rod. And then in this text, it becomes the rod of God. So therefore, on, based on this text, application that we would want to ask ourselves, what is it that the Lord has put in your hand? 
If you're taking notes, yeah, I would encourage you to write that down. What is it the Lord has put in my hand? And then draw a line and just say, Lord, I want to leave this blank until you show me. I don't want to be in a hurry. I don't want to be creative. Like, I just want to seek you through your word every day. And, and eventually, I want you to show me what you've put in my hand that I'm just thinking is a simple tool that I wish I never even had if life had gone how I expected. But here I am, like a simple tool can turn into the rod of God in the hand of a yielded servant. That's pretty beautiful. Yeah, I remember at one phase of life, Lynn and I realized we had our kids, like they were in our hand. Yeah, I mean, I remember in Topeka, like everything was... We went from 13 people to 130 people in about a decade. And, and um, I remember when every night of the week was full except date night and family night. And then I remember realizing I could do more than one thing in an evening. And so you'd start stacking, right? Like you'd go to work all day. And then you'd meet with somebody, whatever. I mean, you'd do something, have somebody over for dinner, whatever it is. But then you, you, I realized, oh, we could do something from 8 to 10 too. And then I remember when the need was too great and you, you went to three things. And then I remember thinking, like, we want to disciple these young people. How on earth do we do this? And it didn't come from me. It came from one of the brothers in the assembly. Um, he had the idea because of his kids, I could just invite somebody to do something with me that I'm already doing. And so I thought Danny's in soccer. And so we started once in a while inviting people to just come with us. And it, it was crazy to me. Like, I, it never occurred to me that people would want to come watch my kid play soccer, right? But these young people, like, they were hungry for the Lord. They loved spending time with the saints. And so our kids were in our hand in that season of life. I remember we had a little dog that I unashamedly adore and still miss. Um, his name was Jackson. Uh, when we moved to California, we called him the gospel dog. And um, they, they would laugh at the, the so the, the Latin men are macho, right? And so they have pit bulls and, um, yeah, and so they would always laugh at this little white guy that's walking this little fluff ball. And, um, but he was adorable. And, um, and they would stop and talk to us. And we had so many conversations because of that dog. Like he was in our hand for the first number of years in our community, and it worked. Yeah, the other day I went to pickleball. I'm one of those. Um, yeah, and I do it for exercise. That's my excuse. And um, anyways, I actually really love it. And I was there, and this guy that I'd never met before, he's from England. He came walking up, and he introduced himself. His name was Mark. My name is Scott. And so I shook his hand, and he sat down. We're waiting for a court to be open. And then I said, you know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, Mark, a perfect man. I said, I have a friend named Mark who loves that verse. <laughs> Mark, a perfect man. And I said, do you know that that verse was in the Bible? He said, no, I'm not much of a Bible reader. And, uh, and then he just jumped right into a spiritual conversation. No reluctance. By the way, if you know me, like my wife knows me, and maybe these guys know me, if you know me, I am not particularly clever. Yeah, and I am not particularly bold. Like I feel very much at home here with you. That's how I'm built. But out there, man, I, I am constantly dependent on the Lord if I'm going to be a good testimony for the Lord Jesus. Yeah, we all know people that are super gifted in that way, and we thank God from them. We learn from them, right? That is not me. Yeah, and yet I looked at this guy, and I just kind of in a humorous way, at least my, my kind of humor, um, you know, mentioned this. And then we just sat there. We had an awesome conversation about the Lord, about his word. I asked him if he'd ever been to a Bible study, and he said, yeah, I have. Um, asked him, you, know, you know what he said? He said, if there is somebody really out there, I would desperately like to know. Yeah. That's an awesome open door, isn't it? Yeah. So pickleball that day was in my hand. Um, she is one of the hardest workers that I know. Uh, she had a burning desire for the gospel, months ago and after thinking it through after praying about it she just realized like I go to the store for the team I go I mean she's just always working yeah I so admire that by the way um 
She is a hard worker for God. Let it be steadfast and movable, abounding in the work of the Lord. And so she just determined before the Lord, this is what's in my hand. I'm going to talk to the woman who checks me out at the grocery store. And then she started bringing these awesome conversations to our team prayer meetings, right, about how the Lord was using the simple things that were in her hand. So I, I want to move on. But um, I'm asking you to ask the Lord, what is it that's in my hand right now? What is it that's a simple, maybe even an undesirable tool, but, but it could be turned into the rod of God when it's in the hand of a yielded servant? That's what we see in the text. Yeah, the rod of Moses becomes the rod of God. Yeah, so what if they won't believe me? God's answer, I will provide the proof. Throw down the rod, it turns into a serpent. Serpent, of course, would make us think of, of Satan. Grab it by the tail, that's the wrong end to grab the serpent by, um, you'd have to trust the Lord to do what, what Moses is being called to do, right? Here's a servant, and you're going to grab it by the tail. Like, that requires a significant amount of trust in God. And then he says, put your hand in your, in your bosom, pull it out. It's leprosy. Leprosy, almost exclusively in Scripture, uh, is a symbol of sin. My little girl, Rebecca, I know she's not that little anymore, but she's my little girl. She got saved because Ken Miller was was speaking on leprosy as a form of sin at Vacation Bible School when Rebecca was six years old. Um, yeah, in the, in the scripture, it talks about how sin just erodes, sin destroys. Man, if there are people here today that don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, the greatest explanation of the gospel that exists in the Word of God is the book of Romans. And there are two reasons in the book of Romans why every single person must be born again. This is 1 through 5, 12, 5, 13 through the end of 8. 1 through 5, 12, what is the first reason why every single person must come to Christ, must be born again? The misery and destruction of, or sorry, the, the wrath of God. Yeah, and we're actually going to see that in our text. Boy, don't, don't think that God is just like Santa Claus. And don't think like hippie Jesus is all Jesus is. Yes, he's merciful and gracious and long-suffering and patient and kind. He is so beautifully that. He's the greatest friend I've ever had in all my life or ever will have. In John 15, he says, no longer do I call you servants, but I've called you friends. That is absolutely true, but he's also a God of, of unspeakable judgment. And so Romans 1, 1 through 5, 12 says, you must be saved from the wrath of God. And then 513 through the end of eight, you must be saved from the misery and destruction of sin. Maybe the Lord brought some of you here today because you've come to the place in your life where you're willing to think with God. You're willing to listen to his voice through the scripture. You've, you've, you would think to yourself today, I've had enough of running my life. I've had enough of me being in charge. I've had enough of sin and, and the effects of sin. I need to be saved. Like that's the argument of Romans. You must be saved from the wrath of God. You must be saved from the misery and destruction of sin. So leprosy is a picture of sin in scripture. Yeah, put your hand in your bosom, miraculously leprosy. That was incurable, by the way. Yeah, incurable, horrific, horrifying disease. When you got it, you were separated from, the, from your family. Little by little, like they would lose fingers, they would lose nose, like you became disfigured. I mean, it was a miserable, horrible ailment. And so if Moses went like this and pulled out a leprous hand, that would be so shocking. And then you put it back like this, pull it out, and it's healed again. So the Lord is saying through his word, through his text, he's saying, I will provide the proof that is needed. And then water to blood. Yeah, three miraculous signs. I will provide all the proof that you need. One, one uh, Bible teacher would put it this way. Uh, the problem is not the paucity of available truth. It's the hypocrisy of our search. I read that back in the day, and I thought, I have no idea what paucity means. Yeah, so I went and looked it up, and it just means lack of. The problem is not the lack of available truth. The problem is the hypocrisy of our search. In other words, there's enough evidence for any thinking person 
to realize that God is the creator of the world. God has revealed himself in a perfect living book. God desires that none should perish, but all come to repentance. He's long-suffering. There's enough for any thinking person. That's why John 7, 17 is one of the key verses to all of Scripture. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know the doctrine, the truth. The will is the key to the intellect. Yeah, we don't want to hear God. We suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So he gives them three evidences, rod to serpent, hand, and then healed, water to blood. Okay, let's move on. Um, fourth excuse. Fourth excuse in this dialogue. I don't have the skills. This is Moses' next excuse. I don't have the skills. I'm hoping that some of you will recognize yourself here. Let's look at verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who made man's mouth? I love this answer. Who made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. So Moses' excuse, I don't have the skills to do what you're calling me to do. I've never made this video, but, but I know you guys, you guys know a guy that we refer to as Micaiah. Yeah, so Micah Tuttle. Um, I've always wanted to make a video and say, and this is complete love, complete respect, thanking God for the gift that he's provided for his church and for his work. I've always wanted to make a video and say, and this is like me trying to encourage me. You don't have to be Micah Tuttle to be launched into pioneer work. That is such a common thought. You know, Micah Tuttle is strongest where I'm the weakest. Like what, and I'm not saying I see myself correctly, but when I look at myself, I think, man, the way the Lord has built that guy, he is strongest, like passionately strongest, where, where I struggle the most. I love, I love that we don't have to, well, here, let's put it this way. Every single person in this room, this is good theology. Every single person in this room was perfectly created by God. Amen? Amen? Every single believer in this room was perfectly gifted by God at salvation. Amen? So any sense of, I don't have the skills to do what you living God, O oh Lord, are calling me to, boy, that's just a lie. Like your, your littleness, my littleness, my weakness, my, my failure, boy, you get to a certain level of growth in the Christian life, and you realize that the Lord is using my failure. Like failure is almost an essential part of growth at one stage. Like I know more today, like the reality of James 3, we all stumble in many ways. I know that more personally today than ever before in my life. And I'm further down the road than I've ever been before. Like how does that work together? More conscious of my weakness, my brokenness, my need of Christ. I need thee every hour Every hour I need thee. So Moses says, I don't, I don't have the skills. In, in essence, this is what that person is saying to God. Lord, you are calling me to a task that you have not equipped me to do. That's a bold statement to make to the living God. And God's answer is awesome. Who made man's mouth? So Moses, right? I'm not eloquent. Now, if you, know, if you know the book of Acts, if you know the New Testament commentary on the Old Testament narrative that we're looking at, Acts says that Moses was mighty in word, that he was eloquent in speech. That guy was a great orator, but 14,600 days as a shepherd, now he, now he doesn't have that, that self-confidence that he had in Egypt. By the way, that's a step forward, not a step back. Yeah, self-confidence is not where we want to be. Yeah, Christ-confidence is where we want to be. Not that we consider 
anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is in Christ. Yeah. So he says, yeah, who made man's mouth? And then I, I really love this. He says, who made the mute? That's a disability. The deaf, that's a disability. The seeing, that's an ability. And the blind, that's a disability. So we can draw from the text that the Lord made you perfectly with your abilities and your disabilities. Isn't that a blessing? The living God looks down from heaven. He knows exactly who you are today. He looks down from the heavens, and he is not sorry that he made you exactly like he made you. If we went to 1 Corinthians 12, then we would see that at salvation, the Holy Spirit baptizes the brand new believer into the body of Christ, and he sets in them in the body as he wills. He made you the part of the body that he wants you to be. So our wrestling, again, it's, it's, it's just such a false narrative. I wish I was like this. Why do you wish that? For God's sake? You're calling me to a big task. Like, that's what Moses could say. You're calling me to an amazing, unfathomable task. But his excuse was really rooted in, in lies and in unbelief. And God's answer is awesome. Um, As you obey, I will teach you. I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what you should say. And so as you obey, the Lord sanctifies you. Please, 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 please obey God today. Like whatever you know that the living God is calling you to, this is for Christ's glory that I'm begging. Just like Paul, Romans 15, he's my example. I'm begging you. Based on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, God's glory, your own well-being. Yeah, don't don't let the lies of the enemy ruin anymore. Don't let a feeling of inadequacy keep you from the awesome calling that God has set before you. Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And don't let the devil rob you. By the way, your circumstances that you are currently in, maybe some of you will recognize the author of this quote. Your circumstances that you are currently in today are the perfect circumstances for you to glorify God. There is no exception to that in this room. So wherever you are, however much you would think like Moses, I just, I don't even know how I ended up here. This is not how I imagine my life going. However much you would identify with that, those are the perfect circumstances for you to submit and to believe God. I love God's answer. I will teach you. I will be with your mouth. In my young 20s, um, I, I heard someone make a comment, and the Lord put this little seed in my heart. Um, yeah, and I just told the Lord. I said, Lord, if you want me to go overseas short term, I always knew my calling was North America, and I know more today than ever before, that's my calling. Um, That's what God has given me. And I knew it in my 20s. I knew it in my teens. Um, But I remember saying to the Lord, if you want me to go overseas short term so that I can have a global perspective in my service for God in North America, would you open the door? And then a brother who's incredibly precious to me, and I think probably incredibly precious to you, came through Kansas, Mike Atwood. I met him, I think for the second time, if I'm remembering correctly. Asked him what he was doing the next day. He was going to Baldwin, but didn't have to be there till later. Do you want to go out and have lunch? We went to Olive Garden. We talked about missionary biographies. We we had a great time. And then he said, have you ever thought of going overseas short term? This was like two weeks after I prayed. And so I said, I've thought about it. And I just kept it to myself, you know. And he said, we have a team of three people. That's Thomas Wheeler and Sam Thorpe and Mike Atwood. And they were looking for a fourth to go over to Kenya and to teach elders, elders conferences, one in Nairobi, one out in the West. And so it wasn't hard to recognize the open door that the Lord gave. I bounced it off of my oversight. They said, if the Lord opens the door, if you desire to go, we would support you going. Like, okay, my wife supported three weeks overseas. And you got to about two months away from that trip. And I really, with all my heart, I wanted to run for my life. Yeah, I called Mike and I said, this is ridiculous. 
Um, like I'm halfway through my 20s, and what I agreed to was flying halfway around the world so that I could teach the leaders of God's people. Like this really is ridiculous. And Mike said, it'll be okay. Like he just kept reassuring me. I called him one other time and I said, I'm formally asking permission to not go. <laughs> I was completely terrified. And this is what it was. I am not prepared. I'm a child. I'm a youth. Yeah, but ultimately the Lord opened the door. Ultimately with Mike's encouragement, I did go. I did see that he was right. I watched the Lord use the word of God. And we ended up actually going every other year for maybe uh, three or four trips, something like that. It was, it was awesome. Yeah, when I read Moses, I'm like, yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, feelings of inadequacy, that's kind of my default mode of life. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Yeah, I mean, that's my default. Like, it causes problems in my marriage sometimes because that's my default mode of everything. It's, it's, I actually have to. So right here, this is what we are in Christ. And I put it in my Bible because I need the encouragement. I need the help. I need to build myself up, right, on my most holy faith. Like, I need to not be filled with unbelief about what the Word of God says, because if I go down that road, man, there's no end to how Satan would love to disqualify me as I proceed with unbelief in that way. Anyways, I just so identify with Moses. Yeah, he says, I don't have the skills. And I love the Lord's answer. As you obey, I will sanctify you. He didn't say, yeah, you're, you're totally wrong. Um, he's like, yeah, you have identified some immaturities. But as you obey me, right, go. And I will be with your mouth. I will teach you. Like sanctification will happen as you go. God doesn't call the sanctified. He sanctifies the call. Amen? Yeah. Okay. Um, last excuse. Look at verse 13. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and he said, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. Look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. I'm going to stop there for sake of time. The last excuse that Moses gives, ah, oh, Lord, like, can't you just send somebody else? Can't somebody else do this? Yeah, so, I mean, he starts out, right? He starts out, I'm not good enough. He goes on to, I don't know enough. What if they don't believe me? I don't have the skills. And then the honest truth finally comes out. It's just ugly self-will. God is calling you to something that's uncomfortable. God is calling you something that, that could cost you your life. Like to go stand before a person that is revered as a God by his people. He rules as a God in his kingdom. And to say, let your entire slave force go. And then the message is crazy strong. Thus you shall say, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. It's not hard to imagine that this was going to be a difficult message for Moses to deliver. That is crazy, that kind of talk. This is the living God, by the way. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, so the excuse, man, can't someone else just do it? What was God's uh, response? Anger. I know this is Theology 101, but do we believe that God was right to be angry in the text? Yeah, He's, he was angry at the self-will of Moses. You were miraculously preserved. You were raised in the way that I wanted. You didn't foresee it, but I guided your life how I wanted I have you prepared now. You became something. You became nothing. Now I'm calling you to this amazing calling. And I know like you're filled with a sense of inadequacy. I know that you've grown comfortable after 14,600 days in the desert. And that would be an easier choice than what I'm calling you to. Maybe a, a preferable choice from Moses' perspective. I know you would rather someone else do it but I'm calling you to this. I want you to notice that what God ultimately does is give him Aaron. Um, Aaron was not Moses. 
like those of you that are Bible readers. Aaron led, led the, the children of Israel into idolatry. Aaron teamed up with Miriam um, in that sad incident. Um, he was not Moses. And so through Moses' persistence, right, he ended up with second best. At least that's how I read the text. Yeah. So let me just say, please don't be so persistent that you, that you end up with second best. I was in my office in Kansas praying years ago, and, and I just was just pouring my heart out to the Lord. And then out of my mouth popped, Lord, I want everything. And then I went, oh, can you say that? And then I thought immediately, I thought, Lord, I want everything you want for me. I want everything that a good God wants for me. Yeah, that's all I want for all of you. I just want, it, it, it is an agony that people choose so much less than God's best. It is an agony. Yeah, don't choose second best. Don't compromise. Yeah, if you, if you want scripture to go meditate on and that makes the point that I'm making, Psalm 81. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that my people would listen to me. I would have fed them with the finest of wheat and with honey out of the rock, I would have satisfied them. But what does he do when you persist in your self-will? He steps back like a gentleman. And he says, okay, I'll let them walk in their own counsel. And then when your kids rebel or when they go to prison or your marriage falls apart, the Lord stands ready at every point to be like, are you willing to let me be Lord of all now? Are you willing to listen now? I will gladly counsel you. I will gladly lead you in the way you should go. I would have done that every step of the way, but you wouldn't listen. Yeah. So yeah, please don't let don't choose second best. Life is more amazing on this earth than I ever imagined it could be. And what I mean is is like John 15, fullness of joy. I didn't really know. I thought that that was an eternal life thing, like future tense. That's been a huge shock. Perfect peace, Philippians 4. Focused on the right things, the peace of God is yours. You're holy. The God of peace is with you. So, so perfect peace, fullness of joy. Man, just don't, don't rob yourself and don't rob joy. Yeah, rob God. Don't rob those that, that live with you. So obedience has a price tag. Absolutely. The living God may call you to some pretty dramatic things. In fact, I hope he does. I would pray that he does. I'm constantly looking for good soldiers of Christ Jesus. I'm constantly praying for them, and I'm constantly looking for them. A good soldier doesn't say, I want this kind of life. A good soldier, like a good Navy SEAL, says, the harder the task, the more of an honor it is. You call, you direct, I'm in. He lives to do the Father's will, the same way that the Lord Jesus did. So obedience has a price tag. Social rejection, professional suicide. I know a police officer who, for Christ, I can't remember the name of the job, it doesn't matter, but he made a decision at the police department that where he was working Monday to Friday, regular hours, but he did it for the Lord and for the assembly. Yeah, and it, so it was professional suicide, but it freed him up to be available for God's people and for the work of the Lord. Uh, your comfort zone could be destroyed through obedience. What about my family? So I would just say this. Obedience is costly. Disobedience costs far more. So yes, obedience is costly. More than ever before, I know that too. Yeah, like I watch other people. I live it to some extent. Obedience is costly. If you choose disobedience today, you're choosing to pay an infinitely higher price. Okay, so application. We do the same thing. I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. What if they don't believe me? I don't have the skills. Can't someone else do it? If we choose the disobedience of excuses, we miss the amazing life the Lord has for us. Okay, let's look at an encouragement and 
a warning, and then and then we'll be done for today. Look at verse chapter four, verse twenty-one. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son your firstborn. We're not going to go into this in depth, but I want everybody, I just want to encourage you, like like your theological box that contains all of your bits of truth that you know about God, just pull that out and make sure you put the phrase in there, I will kill your son. Like make sure that that's in there with everything you know, everything else you know about God. That's an intense being drastically serious. And I would just put it this way. God rules in the kingdoms of men. This is what I would call an encouragement. Do we live in a perfect country? Is it getting better or worse right now? Yeah. This is so encouraging, right? He calls Moses to an incredible task. And then he says, by the way, please be encouraged by this too. He says, it's not going to be easy. I'm going to call you to this, but he's not going to listen to you. Like, that's what he just said. In fact, Young's literal translation puts it this way. And I, I will strengthen his heart, and he doth not send the people away. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a smooth road. To put it in New Testament language, like the way we repeat these things all the time in California, it's probably because the work is hard. The harvest is hard. I'm calling you to be a good soldier of Christ Jesus, unentangled with the world. No soldier enlisted in active duty entangles himself in the affairs of this life that he may please the one who enlisted him as soldier. Disciplined athlete, hardworking farmer, unentangled soldier. Like this is the calling of the believer. He says, right? He's not going to listen to you. This is the message. He's not going to listen to you at first. In verse 20, Moses took his wife, his son, set them on a donkey. He returned to the land of Egypt. Moses took the rod of God in his hand. So there you see it in our text. The rod of Moses became the rod of God. What is it that the Lord has put in your hand? It can become a miraculous tool in the life of a yielded servant. So so, um, Proverbs 21.1, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Pharaoh's heart was hard. The scripture says that. Pharaoh hardened his heart. The scripture says that. The Lord hardened his heart. The scripture says that. And in the mind of God, it all works perfectly to bring about the Lord's purposes. Yeah, it's amazing. It makes us stand in awe of who God is. If you refuse, I will kill your son. Okay, last point for today. This is um, a warning Uh, God is holy and to be feared. God is holy and to be feared. Let's read 24 to 26. It came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Now, I know we've been talking for a little while. Um, who, who Who is trying to kill who? In the verse. Okay, and he came to pass on the way, verse 24, at the encampment that the Lord met him, that's Moses, and sought to kill Moses. That is so shocking. A lot of people would point to this and say, perhaps this is a physical illness. Like the Lord allowed a a horrible physical illness. But as you read down through the text, let's do it, 25. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. That's the Lord let Moses go. He released him. Then she said, you are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. And the Lord said to Aaron, go in the wilderness and meet Moses. So this is, this is such a, I don't know, it's kind of a crazy little part of the story. 
but it's a great warning for people like you and me. God is holy and to be feared. So let's think it through. The Lord takes obedience seriously. Amen? So we started out thinking, what is the Lord going to call you to today? What is the Lord going to call you to in life? Even after you say yes, this story proves that before you lead a nation, you have to lead your family in obedience. He had not seen his family, his son, brought into conformity to the instruction of God, namely circumcision. And God took that so seriously that after Moses had said yes, after he left his insecurities and his fears and his comfort zone, he was giving everything to follow Jehovah, right? He was giving everything now. And the Lord meets him on his journey to obey God. He meets him as if to kill him. And until his family was brought into conformity to God's voice, God's word, he had him. And when conformity was brought about, then the Lord released him. Boy, if, if nothing else, I mean, you see the Lord takes obedience seriously. It appears in the text that Zipporah objects. Moses still had to obey God. If your husband doesn't want you to obey, now how you do it, what manner you do it, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6, I mean, all those things, yeah, there's a lot of wisdom that goes into it. But even if your wife objects, like it appears that she objects in the text, Moses still had to obey God. He was still called to obedience. He was already obeying by going to Egypt, but we must obey all. You can't just be 99% in conformity. You must have a clear conscience before God. You must obey all. You must be willing to stand alone. It's a lot easier to stand with your spouse, isn't it? You must be willing to stand alone. The character of God has not changed. When God calls us to obedience, we are, that's exactly what's required of us. Obedience, not creativity. Full conformity, full obedience. So three, three excuses today. What if they won't believe me? I don't have the skills. Can't someone else do it? An encouragement. God rules in the kingdoms of men. And a warning for all of us. Um, God is holy and to be feared. Uh, to add one little New Testament text in Peter. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear. Yeah. Okay, let's pray. Father, we began... Um, praying for the unleashing of the power of the Spirit of God through the Word of God in this room. And I just want to end by saying, I believe, you. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't believe in prayer in that sense. I, I believe in the God of Yeah, I believe you. I know your heart. I know your character. Without the Word of God, I would not know your heart. I would not know your character. But because of God's Word, I know who you are. I know what you act like. I know how you look at this room. I know your love, your compassion, your desire for good things. Lord Jesus, I know your tears. Yeah, I find that actually super precious. Luke 19, grave of Lazarus. Yeah, we know who you are. I know your desire. You stand in the heavens with such blessing in your hands, ready to pour it out on the people that are here. The problem is not you. The problem is us, the excuses that we make, the lies that we believe. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Satan convinced Eve and Adam, ultimately, that what God has, had said was best for God, but it wasn't best for them. And the entire human race was plunged into sin because of that lie. Lord, if I had to guess, and I'm just a little man, I don't pretend to see people's brains or their hearts. I do know people, and I know what your word says about people. But Lord, if I had to guess, I would say that there's multiple people in the room this morning that are believing that same thing, that what God has called me to might be best for God, but I don't feel like it's best for me. And I don't see how I would even survive yielding in my marriage or yielding to what I've been called to at work or whatever it is. 
Lord, I just want to ask that your truth would win and that your, your life would be the life of this assembly. And I want to pray one more time um, that having seen a great work of God, Lord, I come, I see their love abounding. I see their faith exponentially growing. I see their hope. And I just want to pray more and more and more and more and more. Lord, they could turn around. I've seen it happen. They could turn around. And if I came in 10 years, I could see a lot of devastation. I just pray that it would be more and more and more and more and more. That there'd be not even anything close, not even a thought of settling down or circling the wagons, thinking, let's just maintain this little piece of paradise. Yeah, whatever you call them to, however self-sacrificial it is, help them to know what an honor that is before the one who suffered for us, the, the greatest missionary of all time. Yeah, the Bible is basically a missionary book. You've called us to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into the world, make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always. Please, please, please help them. Lord, next time I come, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that it'll just be more. Yeah, I have no idea when or if, really, that will be. But I pray that the grace of God would be so evident for the glory of Jesus Christ alone. Thank you for the time to look at your word. We commit it to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen.